We thank the God of heaven, which doeth all things well, for sparing us and blessing us with this glorious privilege to be able to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of worshiping him in spirit and in truth. I want to thank Brother Williams for the opportunity to come and share. Brother Williams has an outstanding ministry that is far reaching. You are touching as many people as Brother Williams touches on a weekly basis. You don't just ask anybody to come and put them on the air. I understand that. So I want to thank him for the confidence that he has in me and for the relationship we have forged over the years. And I thank God for his ministry that's local and his ministry that is national. And we thank God for being here on this morning. It's good to see some of you who I've known over the years and some of you who I look forward to getting to know. Now, I must say that the devil has been working hard to try to keep me from not doing what I'm prepared to do today. Devil's been working hard, but we are going to, in spite of all of his efforts, we're going to do what we came here to do. Amen? Amen. We're going to do what we came here to do. Now, I'm getting ready to talk about marriage. And the information that I have, I usually do over several weeks, sometimes five or six weeks. I have a small window of time to bring an overview that hopefully will give you tools that you can use to help you to better understand and navigate relationships of marriage. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to move as fast as I can and then slow down when I need to, to make sure that I emphasize what needs to be emphasized. And I need, Brother Williams, I need you to give me my five minute warning. If you just give me my five minute warning. Yeah, so, 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 so I'll know when to wrap. I know when to wrap when I get the five minute warning, all right? Uh, and, and so let us see what the Lord has in store for us uh, on today. Now I'm talking about God's design for marriage. So I want us to start with, with 1 Peter uh, chapter three, uh, 3 and verse number 7. This is from the uh, New American Standard Version. I want you to hear the tone that Peter is writing uh, to the churches. He says, you husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel since she is a woman. Wait a minute. I wonder why would Peter say and make an obvious statement you need to live with your wives in an understanding way as a weaker vessel since she is a woman. Wait a minute. Wouldn't my wife be a woman? then why are you telling me that I need to remember that she's a woman? Every time I look at her, I know she's a woman. But Peter is saying, you need to understand something. She is not like you. She does not think like you. She does not respond like you. And you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with her, that she is a woman, never forget, she is not a man. She is a woman. That's important. Now, with you doing that as a man, you grant her honor as a fellow of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, uh, next slide. Same, same verse, the Living Bible. I want you to hear it in the Living Bible. Yeah, yeah. You husbands must be careful of your wives. Be careful, being thoughtful of their needs and honoring them. 
Remember that you and your wife are partners in receiving God's blessings. Wait a minute. There is a partnership that takes place in the relationship called marriage that if it's going to work, you must receive the blessings of God. You got to receive the blessing of God. And by the way, fellas, and if you don't treat her as you should, if you don't do this thing right, your prayers will not get ready answers. So God says, your ability to communicate with me and know I'm answering you hinges on the way you deal with your wife. If you don't deal with her right, then you not only mess her up, but you mess up your relationship with me. Everybody got that? All right, next slide, next slide. Now, so the God in the scriptures speaks to core issues that every marriage has. And I want to talk about those core issues, core being a small but essential ingredient of every marriage, this is a small part of every marriage that must not be compromised, it must not be neglected, it must not be ignored if your marriage is to succeed overall. There are some things at the core that you have to understand in your marriage if your marriage is going to succeed. Now, there are three core issues in every marriage. First of all, there are some core roles. Now, this is going to shake you a little bit. You see, um, I, I, grew up, I grew up in an era where uh, we watched things like Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, My Three Sons, okay? This was an era when um, the roles in marriage were clearly defined. In fact, it was an era when uh, women did not really work outside of the home. I grew up in a home where my mother never worked outside of the home. I didn't say she never worked, because if you're working at home, that's a job too. Amen. If you're keeping the house, that is a job. If you make sure when he comes home, everything is copacetic, that's a job. Okay? But we're moved and we've transitioned into an era where we base all of our living and livelihood on two incomes. That's what we've done. And we put ourselves under the gun to say, in order for us to make it, it's going to take both of us doing it. And I recommend to couples, when I talk to them, if you can live on one income or one and a half income and invest that other part, you will be financially independent in 20 years. But you'll never get to financial independence because you're trying to keep up with everything right now. That's another sermon. That's another story. Okay, another sermon. I just thought I'd drop that. So core roles, then core responses. There are some things that a husband and wife must do for each other. There are some things, wives, you must do for your husband. There are some things, husband, you must do for your wife that actually empowers your mate's role. You can respond to your husband and wife in such a way to where they are actually able to fulfill their role better. And then there are some core concerns. There are some concerns that every man has in a relationship, and there are some concerns that every woman has in a relationship, in a marriage. There are a number of needs. Every man and woman has some needs that you and your wife have, and I don't care how long you've been married, I don't care how much time it takes, those needs never change. I don't care how old you get, you're going to have these needs. So we got core roles, core uh, needs, and core concerns, right? Now let's go back to core, core, next slide. So core roles. Now, when it comes to the core roles for uh, the wife, next slide, for the wife, the next slide is the core role of a wife is 
helper. Now I'm going to let this marinate just a second. Wives, your core biblical role, according to scripture, is helper. Now before you get bent out of shape about this role of helper, I want you to know you're in great company. There are only three of the beings in scripture that are described as helper. Women are being the fourth in scripture described as helper. Let me show you those other three. God our Father is described as our helper. He helps us and he supplies what we are not able to get by giving us access to salvation by sending his son. So God helps us. You know the story, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Then Jesus Christ is our helper. He is the go-between. He's the mediator between us and our Father. We can't get to God without going through Christ. So Jesus helps us and then the Holy Spirit helps us because we don't even know what to pray about. We don't even know how to pray effectively but the Spirit of God ushers up to God what we are trying to say. And women is called helper in Scripture. Alright? So the Bible says then in Proverbs 31, 10, and 12, and 29, and 20, 27, and 29, you know this story. An excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. The heart of a husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain because he trusts in her. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, he praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, uh, but you excel them all. In other words, there are a lot of women out there, but ain't no woman like the one I got. Now that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying at the gate. You know, you got it. There are a lot of women out there, but ain't no woman like the one I got. And every man needs to feel about his woman that ain't no woman like the one I got. Okay, I got. But she, she has to be willing to help him. And by the way, and guys, you have to be willing to allow her to help. Now that's a problem. Because see, sometimes we are difficult and we don't allow women to help us. They know when we are tired and we need to shut it down and they're trying to say, honey, uh, I know you're not getting ready to go and play some more, do this or do that. You know, why don't you sit down and rest? Now she's trying to help. Oh baby, I, I'm okay, I'm gonna got it, I got it, I got it. Honey, you know you ought not eat this because you know that's gonna bother your, 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 your diabetes, that's gonna bother your blood pressure. You know you ought not eat this late, honey. No, no, I'm gonna be all right. See, she's trying to help, but every time she's trying to help, you shut her down. So she gets to the point where she says, well, I can't help him. But her natural inclination is to help you. She has your best interest at all. Nobody will care more about you than she will. So you need to be willing to listen to her advice. Because she's trying to help you. All right. Now, the core role as husband in scripture is head. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. Now sister, before you get bent out of shape, let me help you to understand, he's not the head because he's the wisest. He is not called head because he's the smartest. He's not called head because he's always right. He's a head because God designated in the lineage of lineage of mankind, he made man first. Listen to me carefully. The, the only argument that Paul makes for women not usurping authority over the man, his only argument is, didn't you see God made man first? That was intentional. 
He, now, God could have made a man and a woman at the same time simultaneously, but he made the man, took from the man's side, woman, right? You know the story, right? And made the woman, but he made man first to show the order that God intended for the family to maintain. The head is the man. So the Bible says, Ephesians 5, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. As Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. That's the pattern. Now, so there are some core responses then that will empower each one of you. Core responses. Now, first of all, your responses can encourage your mate or discourage. The way you interact with your spouse man or woman, you can either help them be better at being a wife or husband based on your response, or you can make it hard. You can make it hard for them to do what they are designed to do and trying to do by your responses. Now, our response to each other will determine how easy it is to fulfill your roles, or it can make it difficult, not impossible. Wait a minute, difficult, not impossible for you to fulfill the roles. It can make it difficult, not impossible, to fulfill the roles. Now, what are the roles? Okay, keep going. The core response from a husband to the wife that the wife never tires of and always needs from you, brothers, is honor and praise. She always needs from you honor and praise. She needs you to honor her and praise her. And I don't care if you did it on Valentine's Day, that ain't enough. I don't care if you did it on her birthday, that ain't enough. She needs a continuous honoring and praise from you. Now, why should you honor and praise her, brother man? Why should you honor and praise her? Because the number one question in the mind of a woman is this. If I submit to him, will he recognize my worth and the value I bring to the marriage? That's her biggest concern. She knows that she's inclined to submit, but if she submits, Will you take advantage of her? Well, or will you honor her and respect her and praise her? And the only way she knows that you really are respectful of her is how you honor and praise her. That's her parameter. That's how she knows that you are honored. And that gives her peace of mind to know I can continue to respect him and support him and submit to him. All right? See, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 7, you husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel since she is a woman and grant her honor. Listen, that's not a suggestion, brothers. You need to grant her honor as a fellow of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Proverbs 31, 28b and 29, her husband praises her, her husband praises her, saying, uh, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel in my baby. There are a lot of women out there, but ain't no woman like the one I got. Now that's what she said, that's what he's saying. That, that's the current vernacular. Okay, and, and so she's able to keep doing what she does for him because every chance he gets, he say, baby, ain't nobody like you. Baby, I sure love you. Baby, I sure appreciate what you're doing. Baby, you do it better than anybody can do it. Baby, I know you've been doing it a long time and I love the way you, she, she, she gets a continuous praise. And with that, she's able to just keep on trucking. She can keep on trucking because she getting a continuous praise. Everybody with me? All right, now, now, the core response that a man needs from his wife is submission. I just said a bad word. I know I just said a bad word, submission. Women, you have to deliberately and intentionally come under his leadership. 
All right, you, you, now I'm talking about the core response. You got to come under his leadership. Wives, Colossians 3.18, be subject to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. You need to come under, subject yourself to his leadership. Well, keep it right there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. But, but, no, use that the right place. But, but what if he can't lead? What if he don't know how to lead? Well, you married him. And you knew before you got him that he couldn't leave. And then after you get into marriage, you get upset because he ain't doing what you want. Well, he hadn't learned how to do that. And if you really want him to do that for you, you have to learn how to teach him how to do that. Uh, I went, I went, I was, I, I was in Arizona uh, a week or so ago and I was staying over a family member's house, my uncle's home. Uh, and I was staying at his home in Arizona going there for a graduation. And uh, they had, I had a setup for me. It was really nice. You know, I had the whole basement by myself, a bathroom, big old screen TV, big as the wall. You know, I had all that to myself down in, in the basement. It was myself. So when I got up in the morning and, and I got up and I got ready to come upstairs, I smelled the breath was cooking, I made my bed. I made up my bed. And then after I took my bath, I cleaned out the tub and put everything real neat and straightened up everything. And, and my aunt said, well, you don't have to do that. You didn't have to do that. And I told her, my wife taught me <laughs> that you don't go nowhere and dirty up somebody's house and not clean up behind you. So I didn't know that when I first got married. But after 40 years, she got me pretty trained now. Yeah, yeah. Brother S.C.W. Gibbs Jr., the late great S.C.W. Gibbs Jr. used to say in Fort Worth, you know, it doesn't mind, you don't mind being henpecked when the right hand pecking you. <laughs> yeah, when you being pecked by the right hand, it ain't nothing wrong with henpecked. Okay, so why submission? Let's go. Listen. Because submission allows you as a woman to keep as a goal his leadership in view. You got to always remember God intend for him to lead. God intend for him to be the head. God intend for him to direct the family. How can I help him do that? If the man is to lead and direct his family, then you can't compete with him. This ain't no competition. You may have more education. You may make more money, but you don't make him feel like he ain't dead. You don't throw in his face, oh, well, you know, I, got, I, you know, I make more money, you know, than, than, than I, I get to that. Well, hold up. You castrate in his manhood. You make him feel less than a man. You cannot compete with him. This ain't no, marriage is not a competition. It's a unity where you become one and you learn how to work together to accomplish the goals that you set out to accomplish. Am I helping anybody? Am I helping anybody? All right, listen, listen. Next slide, next slide, next slide. Submission. So go back, go back. Submission is a stepping out of the way and not competing, but you learn how to empower him. You got to learn how to empower him. Okay. Let, let me help you with some. See, see, if you don't learn how to empower him, there's a woman out there who will whisper to him, you know, you show sure our good. You know, you show, I love the way you do what you do. You don't know nobody do it like you. What is she doing? She's empowering him. And if he's not careful, he'll be attracted to that voice 
because at his core, he needs to know that you admire and respect him. Submission does not mean you become a yes person. Submission doesn't mean that, that you don't have nothing to say. You just sit there and no matter what he does, you just go along with it. That's not submission. If, if your husband is about to drive the family over the cliff and you know he's determined to drive that way, you just say, honey, wait a minute. Uh, just let me and the kids out. <laughs> and if you just got to drive on over the cliff, you just go right on. But you let us get out first. You understand? So you don't, you don't become a yes person. Submission is not a man's to demand. Listen, bro, you can't demand that she submit. You can't make her submit. It's a woman's to give. She got to want to give it to you. She got to want to give you. She has to want to come under you. She has to want to come under you. I see, I see a couple of friends of mine, uh, James and one of they, they members at Forest Hill, and they're they real, real good friends of mine, real good friends of mine. And, and, and I know I know she, she's an independent woman, but she comes under James. You know why? Because he's the head. And she lets him lead her. And he know how to lead, too. And so she'll have no problem coming right on under that. See, she'll have no problem with that. You understand what I'm saying? So you can't, de he can't demand it. You got to give it. Submission is a, is a stepping out of the way. Okay? It's a stepping out of the way, but you're not enabling his wrongdoing. See, if you know he's living wrong, acting wrong, doing wrong, you're not being submissive by just sitting there and saying, I'm just going to go along with his wrong. You have an obligation as a Christian to live a certain way before God. And if he chooses not to live that way, then you need to let him know, love you, honey, but I'm not going down that road with you. Love you, honey, but I'm not going to cover for you. Love you, honey, but I ain't going to lie for you. Like when the man comes to the door, honey, honey, tell him ain't nobody here. Ain't nobody. Tell him I ain't at home. Tell him how. No, no, baby, you here. And, and if you want him to know you ain't here, then just don't answer the door. But if I go there, I'm going to tell him you here. You don't enable his wrongdoing. Wives, be subject to your husband that's fitting in the Lord, Colossians 3.18. Okay, now, now, we're getting ready to get into the meat now. There are some core concerns. Now, here, this is where the rubber meets the road that meet your mate's deepest needs. You see, a lot of times we're in our relationships and we have real needs. But first of all, we don't know how to communicate those needs. That's one thing. It's hard for us to say and put in words sometimes what we really need. But we know we ain't getting what we need. But we don't know how to say really what we need sometimes. But we know we're frustrated because we, and we're frustrated because we ain't getting what we need. But we don't know how to say what we need. Everybody with me? So I want to talk about the needs that you may not know how to communicate. All right? Now, every man at the core needs companionship. Hold it right there, don't move. Every man needs companionship. But let me help you some, sister. Companionship with a man or for a man is different than companionship for you. And you need to understand that. Now, what is companionship for a man? Okay. Well, uh, if, if, uh, let me ask you this, ladies. If you're not at home, if you're not at home and you're later than, than you supposed to be, he going to call you and he going to ask you what, one question. What are you going to say? Where you at? Right? Am I right about it? Where you at, baby? You know, where you at? Because he thought you'd have been home by now, or, or you're not where you, he thinks you ought to be. So when he called, he, all he want to know is, where you at? 
Now, you would think that he's calling because he miss you. And he can't wait for you to get home. But that ain't it. He just needs to know where you are. So when you come home, he been calling you, blowing up your phone. Where you at, babe? When you get home, I'll be home in about five minutes. I'm just stopping by the store. I'm picking up one more loaf of bread. And I'm getting that meal, and I'm coming on in. Okay, all right, we'll see you in a minute. And you come through the door, you would think as many times as he called you, he be waiting with a kiss. Hey, baby, so glad to see you. He be waiting to hug you. Baby, I'm so glad to see you. But then you come in, and he don't even move. So what is companionship for him? Look, look, he just needs to know that you are around. You are around. He, he, listen, uh, if it gets quiet in the house, he'll, he'll miss, and he hear you bump back there, oh yeah, she's still here. He good, he good. He knows you are there, and that's, good enough for him to know. See, he doesn't need to engage with you for him to feel good about companionship. He just needs to know you are with him. Everybody with me? But he needs to know you with him. So don't get confused when he's always asking you about where y'all, where y'all, and then when you get around, when he get there, he ain't got no time for you. Like, well, I thought you, well, why was you calling me? Because he just needs to have you nearby. <laughs> That's companionship for him. All right? All right? Don't get confused with it. And, and, and he's good with that. That's what he needs. Now, next one. He needs your admiration. He needs to know that you admire him. Now, the worst thing you can do for your man is to always be talking about the good qualities of another man. Now, if you really want to rub him raw, uh, start talking about, you know, Brother Williams, he's so this, and Brother Williams always know how to do this, and Brother Williams does that. Brother Williams, Brother Williams, Brother Williams. He don't want to hear about Brother Williams. <laughs> he don't want to, he don't want to hear about Brother White. He don't want to hear about Brother White this, Brother White that. He don't want to hear about Brother White. And listen, if he's not a member, he's going to come to church just to check out Bro White. He ain't coming to church to hear the word. He want to know why you coming all the time and why you so excited about coming. Let me go down here and see what's going on. She never been getting up, leaving in the morning, going to church, and now she can't miss and all excited. Let me go check this out. She, he coming to check it out. She, he needs to know, sisters, that you admire him. Amen. You need to find ways to let him know how special he is by acknowledging the things that you know he does well. Now here's what we do. Here's what we do a lot of times, and this is men and women, but sisters, uh, we'll always point out what he doesn't do, but we never tell him what he does well. So if every time you talk to him, you are trying to help, and you think you're helping him, so I'm telling him what I know I need him to do. But every time you talk to him, you're telling him something he doesn't do. So what he learns in his subconscious is, I never do anything right to you. Because you never talk about what I do right. You only talk about what I don't do well. So he needs to know you admire him. Uh, I've been married 40 years, been married 43 years uh, to the same woman. And, and, uh, uh, and she's, she's heard me preach all 40 years somewhere. She's heard me preach all 40 years. You know, she's, she's heard, ain't nothing, she, she's heard my messages for 40 plus years. And without fail, every Sunday, 
every Sunday, she's going to tell me, baby, you did a great job. Yeah. Baby, the way you said this, this, and this, and you pointed out that, and you tied those scriptures in, that was, that was on point. And I say, I say, really, baby? <laughs> I said, I said, really? I said, did I really? Yeah, you, you was on it. You was on it. And the way you did this and this, I said, really, baby? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, just, I'm just laughing it out. <laughs> tell me some more, baby, tell me some more. Okay? And I don't care how many folk tell me how good my message was. I don't believe I done anything. Till I hear her say, oh, you did it. Oh, you did it today. Did it really? Bad? Yeah, you did it today. You see, every man wants admiration from his own. I don't care how many sisters come up there. Brother White, you know, and she just bending my brother White, you know you did such a great job. That don't mean nothing until she says. Because see, what she says to me is the most important thing in my life. How she feels about me is the most important thing to me, right? So every man needs admiration. Every man. Then every man needs support. Every man needs to know that you support and believe in him. Now, now let me help you with something. Now, sometimes we can come up with some ideas that, that are, are kind of far-fetched and not well thought out. I'll acknowledge. You know, sometimes we're ready to jump and we don't look before we jump, right? But even though he has a backward plan, you need to be careful about how you talk to him about it. Now, baby, I, you, I want you to know I believe in you and you can do anything. But have you thought about this, this, and this when it comes to that? You see, first you support him. Baby, I believe in you. Baby, you can do anything. But have you thought about this, this, and this with that? He ready to quit his job. He going out here, he going to become an entrepreneur. Go give up his 401k. <laughs> And his insurance. So you can't go to the doctor and he gonna make 10000 a month. And you know he ain't never been in business in his life. Now baby, you know I believe in you. And ain't nothing I know you can't do. But have you thought about <laughs> how we may need this insurance for a little longer? And is it a way for you to maybe do this on a part time basis and keep because and, and I can support you with that. You understand what I'm saying? See, he needs to know you believe in him. So don't just kill his dream. Because you got to know when you do that, you're killing him. You're killing him. Next slide. Next slide. Watch this. Watch this. Shante Philhan conducted a survey of over a thousand men, and they did this survey for men and women. Watch this. The question was asked to men, if you had to choose between two bad things, would you rather feel alone and unloved in the world, or would you rather feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone? The answer was, 74% said they would rather feel alone and unloved than to feel inadequate and disrespected. So if a man feels disrespected by you, he's automatically feeling unloved by you. You got to get that. Don't miss this. If he feels like you don't respect him, then he automatically feels like you don't love him. Everybody with me? Okay. So if you're going to love your man in the way he needs to be loved, then you need to understand, you need to ensure that he feels your respect. 
most of all. He has to know you respect him. You respect him. Now, how do you know when you've crossed the disrespect line? There's a barometer. How do you know when he's feeling disrespected? There's one easy barometer. Check for anger. When he starts getting upset, it's because he feels disrespected. And he, when he feels disrespected, he feels unloved. And if he's feeling unloved and disrespected, he's going to get mad. So when you start seeing him getting mad, you need to understand you're crossing the disrespect line for him. And every man has a different parameter when it comes to disrespect. Every man is a little different. Okay, every man's just a little different. My wife can say some things to me that, that, that may sound disrespectful, but we've been married 40 years. I know she loves me, so she can say that to me, and I know she's not tearing me down. But then if she goes a little far, I have to say, okay, now you ain't have to say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we getting closer to, I'm feeling disrespected. Okay, baby, now, now, you didn't have to do it like that. It didn't take all of that for you to get your point across to me. Everybody with me? See, see, she start pushing the parameter, and it takes a lot for me to, but when I feel it, she can tell because that, that's something in you start rising up. You're being disrespected, you feel it. Now, here's one way to do it. Check for anger. You got to check for anger. When you see his anger, he's feeling disrespected. You need to understand that. Now, it's not real to him unless you show it. He needs to see it. Okay? Now, there are four major areas that he needs you to respect him in. Four areas he needs to be respected in. Number one, he needs you respecting his judgment. He needs to know that you respect his judgment. That means that if he is figuring it out and it's not a good plan when he gets through, you don't shoot him down and tell him how dumb that is. I know you ain't trying to do that. <laughs> Baby, you know that ain't gonna work. You know that ain't gonna work. Uh, you need to help. Listen, you got to respect him, baby. Uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but have you really thought it all the way through? Have you considered this or that? Now you are respecting him before you correct him. Everybody with me? But if you just jump to, that's double dumb. <laughs> Okay, he feels disrespected. And, and number two, you got to respect his abilities. You got to respect the fact that he's able to do. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a handyman. I'm not a, I'm not a handyman. But my wife grew up in a family where her father was a plumber. And, and they fix everything. Her brothers, okay, another one of them is a plumber, another one is a mechanic, like he can work on just about anything. So she grew up around men who didn't call other men in to do anything. They got it done. And then she married me. <laughs> and then she married me. Okay. And, and, I don't like to fix nothing. <laughs> now, I'm telling you the truth, I don't like to fix nothing. But, but, for her, okay, I try, I try to fix it. So, so, you know, we had a, we had a storage problem uh, and everything was in the garage. So I told her, I say, uh, baby, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna build us a storage house. And she said, you gonna do what? I'm going a, I'm a, I'm a to build, build a storage house, you know? And so I went and I bought one of those uh, rubber made storage houses you put together. So, so, and I read up on it, you know, I, I can read. So I read up on it and I said, okay, you got to make a hardwood floor. So I made the, I made the platform floor and I built that, you know, and, and then I put a rubber mat that came with the kid on it and I started putting that thing together. 
you know? Uh, and I say, baby, I need your help to hold this. So she came out and she held it. And I, man, and I built that thing. I built that thing. And, and every now and then she'll say, you know, I can't believe that thing's still standing, okay? <laughs> you know, you know uh, uh, but, but, but you did that thing. You did it. <laughs> every time, every time we have a windstorm come through, you know, she go and peek out there and say, oh, it's still standing. You did okay. You did okay. Okay, you know. You got to respect his ability. Am I helping anybody? Am I helping anybody? Okay, okay. Not only that, you got to respect him in the way you communicate. You got to respect him in how you come. You got to talk to him in a respectful way. You got to talk to him in a respectful way, right? And then you got to always respect him in public. Always respect him in public. The worst thing you can do is put him down in public. The worst thing you can do is make a joke on him in public. And everybody laughing but him. It ain't funny to him because you are disrespecting him. You don't bring up his worst points publicly and tell it as a joke to anybody. I don't care how bad, I don't care how bad I am at fixing stuff, Sister White ain't gonna never come and use that in a public forum and talk against me publicly. Anything, in fact, whenever she's talking about me to anybody, she calls, she says, Brother White says, Brother White does. She always refers to, to me with other people as Brother White. If she's talking to somebody on the phone and they ask about me, she says, Brother White is here. Brother White is doing. She always respects me in public. She never calls me Emmanuel to anybody in public. That's the private name. <laughs> that's, that's her name. Privately to call me. And, and she's trying to teach all the other sisters and you need to call him Brother White too. Because she calls me Brother White to everybody. So you got to respect him in public. And then sisters, then sisters he needs, his core concern is physical responsiveness. He needs to know that you want to be with him as much as he wants to be with you. He needs you to respond to him physically. We got to go in this a minute, okay? Watch this, watch this. You see, sex changes everything for him. Changes everything. Why? Because sex unlocks a man's emotions. And guess who holds the key? You hold the key to his emotions. Sex holds the key for him. It's the key to his emotions. His emotions. Sex feels a powerful emotional need for him. See, you, you, you don't understand. See, if he's been dealing with the world all week long, dealing with issues all week long, sex helps him to feel free. Sex helps him to exhale. That's how he exhales. Sex. 
You see, popular opinion portrays as one as, as, as a one gland for men, the sex gland with no emotional attached. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. Men have more than more emotions, but that, that is a part of his emotion. Some survey questions were asked, and watch this. With regard to sex, for some men, it is sufficient to be sexually gratified whenever they want. For other men, it is also important to feel wanted and desired by their wife. Don't move. How important is it for you to also feel sexually wanted and desired by your wife? Wait a minute, wait a minute. There was a time in my life We've been married 40 some years. It didn't matter whether she wanted to or not. And whether she was all in it or not. Uh, it was time. <laughs> it was time and it don't matter. Okay, you ain't, listen, you ain't gotta be all into it, but I'm coming. Listen, listen, so how important is it for you to feel wanted, all right? But see then, as you get older and you are married longer, you wanna know that she wants you. Marvin Gaye put a song out, I want you. He said, but I want you to want me too. Just like I want you. In other words, I, I, I want to be there, baby, but I need to know you want to be with me like I want to be with you. Everybody with me? So 97% of men said getting enough sex wasn't by itself enough. They wanted to feel wanted. So it's not just going through the act with him, but it's making sure that he knows that you want him. That's what he needs to know, okay? Not that you're just providing a way out, but you are with him in this act. So how can we overcome the sex act? You got to choose to love him the way he needs. You got to make a decision that you're going to love your man the way he needs to be loved. You got to learn how to love him the way he needs to be loved. You see, you got to first know that you're responding to a tender heart that's hiding behind all that testosterone. You know, I know he's strong and he manly, he barks, but when it comes to you and sex, he's so tender, he's so vulnerable. He, he wants you to, to wound him. I know you think he don't care about nothing, but when it comes to you, he cares. He may not know how to put it in words, but he's feeling that. If responding physically seems out of question, if, if you just can't go right now with him, then let your words be heart words, reassuring words, be a doing word. Baby, um, I, I know you feel it right now, but you know, uh, I'm really not feeling it right now. I want to love you and I want you to love me but this is really not a good time for me. Can we do this another time? Okay. See, see, you're not just saying no. You're reassuring him. Because when you say no to him and you don't reassure him, he interprets it as, oh, you don't want me. Now, baby, I want you. But this ain't a good time for me right now. Okay. This ain't a good time. So you need to understand, sisters, that you have to communicate and sex is vitally important for him, okay? And how you deal with him in that is crucial. It's crucial. Everybody with me? Now let's go to the core concerns for women. How much time do I have, Willie? I got about 10 minutes. Take your time. Take your time. All right, all right. They say take my time, okay? All right, all right. <laughs> listen, but I'm going to follow you. All right. Uh, listen, men, women also need companionship. But it's different for them. 
you see, you see, from from his perspective, you know, he could he could see you in a broke down road, you know, just raggedy road, and you just going through the house, and you move a certain way, and he on you like white on rice. And you trying to figure out what in the world did I do? <laughs> okay. I ain't saying no, what did I do? Because see, he's, he, re, he responds to the visual about you sometimes. But for women, brothers, they need companionship. Yeah. Now, let me help you with something. Now, this will bless your relationship if you get this. If you get this, when you come home, if you work and y'all work a party, you work outside the home, when you get ready to come into her, the first 30 minutes you there, you do this. You say, baby, how was your day? And you listen, not while you're watching your phone, not while you're watching CNN, not while you're looking down. You put all that stuff away and you say, baby, how was your day? And you listen. You look in her eyes, you pay attention to her. And she's going to start talking. And then she's going to start winding down because she thinks you can have it all you can date. And this is going to bless you right here. And when she start winding down, you say this. Honey, tell me some more. <laughs> tell, tell me some more about that. And she said, okay, she got more. She'll, she'll go again. <laughs> she'll go again. And, and... And when she started winding down, first 30 minutes, and she started winding down, you say, baby, tell me some more about that. If you give her that time, 30 minutes, where you give her undivided attention, that'll change your relationship. Because she'll know you're paying attention to her. Now, I'm, I'm in ministry, been in ministry a long time. And ministry is demanding. Ministry is demanding. There's always somebody pulling on you when you're in ministry. I'm always thinking, I'm always planning. And then I'm an entrepreneur too, so I got stuff going on too. So I'm always moving, I'm always doing stuff. And when we go on vacation... We, we don't vacation with family or friends. So don't ask us to go with you, no. You can't come, and I don't care where it is, we ain't going with you. <laughs> because when we get there, she wants my undivided attention. And so we go on vacation three weeks. It's me and her. I'm, I'm catering her all day long. I ain't, I ain't thinking about nothing else. I try to put my electronics down. I don't check my emails. I don't do none of that. I give her undivided attention because she needs that companionship. And then she needs security. She needs to feel secure. Now, guys, you need to understand the deal is not closed just because she married you. You think because she, she stood with you and said, I do, the deal is over. No, that ain't the deal. Your wife doesn't feel permanently loved once the marriage papers are signed. You need to understand that, guys. You see, yes, she knows you love her, but there are periodic times when her feelings need to be convinced and reassured. She needs ongoing reassurance, okay? Ongoing. See, under what circumstance do you think about, this is a question, do you think about to women, your relationship, whether it is going well or how your man feels about you? Now listen to this, guys. How often in a day do women think about the relationships? Watch this. Watch this. Roll it. It's something that I'm conscious of most of the time. 19% of the women said, I'm thinking about my relationship most of the time. Even when I'm a woman, I'm thinking of a relationship. Watch this. It's, it, it's often, occasionally in the back of my mind, 50% say, it's always in the back of my mind, my relationship. Watch this. Watch this. Only when we are in really difficult season of our relationship, 20% says, then, and then some of them say, never. What am I saying here? Women, I don't care what they are doing, they are always thinking about the, re the relationship. Now, when you're at work, you ain't thinking about 
the relationship unless something's going wrong. And you know it. But other than that, you ain't think about relationship. But we, even when she's working and away, she's always thinking about you and the way you interact. That's always on her mind. So when you are feeling insecure about his love and a relationship, which of the following areas are true about your feelings? I need reassurance. 44% of the women said, I wish he would just reassure me that he loves me. I might become quite preoccupied until I get that reassurance. 20% said, I'm in a fog until I know he really He's with me, okay? I withdraw emotionally. 32% of the women say, you know, when I don't feel like he's connected, I just withdraw. And brothers, you're trying to figure out why she withdrawing. It's because she doesn't feel like you are connecting with her. And then I become depressed. 20% of them say I become depressed because I don't know whether or not he really is with me. Remember, on and praise, on and praise, on and praise. She never gets tired of on. That's how she knows that you're with him, honoring and praising. Okay? And then the total answer was 74% of the women feel a certain way about the relationship all the time. All right? Now, what causes these feelings of insecurity? Watch this. Conflict. When there's conflict going on in your marriage... Anything that gives them the feeling that something is wrong, that the two of you are at odds, or that you are unhappy with her, that's conflict. And that makes her think about the relationship all the time. She's going to work with it. She's going to bed with it. She's getting up with it. Watch this withdrawal, which, of course, is, men how we respond to conflict. When we know something going on, we say, Okay, let me just go and leave her alone for a while, and I'll come back when I think it's okay. We tend to withdraw, but she needs you to engage, okay? Then silence, even, even if we say anything that's wrong. She'll say, is anything wrong? No, nothing is wrong, because women have a radar for unspoken conflict. You, you, you come in and your countenance is changed and she says to you, what's wrong, honey? And you say, nothing. You lying. She can tell you lying. And you don't trust her enough with the truth. You think she can't handle the truth. God made her a helper. She can handle whatever you give her. Trust her even with your fears. Trust her. She'll support you. Regular reassurance is necessary. Watch this. Doing conflict, reassure of your love. If you want to help her, even when you're in conflict, just reassure. Now, baby, I know we're, we're having discussion, but I just need you to know I love you. Baby, I know we're disagreeing right now, but I just need you to know I love you. Uh, when you need space, reassure is not about her. Because, see, guys need space sometimes. And, and when you need space, you need to tell her, now, baby, I just need a little break, but it ain't about you. I just need a little break, okay? Number three, if she's upset, realize she doesn't need space. She's not like you. She needs a hug. So when she's upset, don't leave her alone. Go to her. Even if you just got to sit by her, let her know you with her. And then, if she needs to talk about the relationship, baby, we need to talk. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Not the talk. Okay. Yeah, we need to talk. Okay. Listen. Do your best to listen without becoming defensive. Try to listen and not become defensive. Let her get it out. Hear her. Hear her heart. And if she's being difficult, don't stop reassuring her of your love. If she's hard in a bad place, baby, I know we're going to get through this. You know, I love you. Baby, you, you, listen, you know we've been through worse, and we're going to get through this. You know, I love you. Keep reassuring her. Keep reassuring her. And then she needs significance. She needs to feel important. And I'm rapping with this. I'm, I, see, I told you this is a full five-week 
and I'm cramming you right now, okay? Listen, a thousand women will ask this question. I'm wrapping up now. Regardless of how you think you look, sisters, do you have a deep need or desire to know that your husband or your significant other finds you beautiful? Regardless of how you think you look, you need to know what he thinks. Women 45 and younger, 77% said, yeah, I need, I need for him to tell me I'm looking good. Women that are 35 and younger, 84% of them said, I need him to tell me I look good. Now you got all these mirrors around the house. You've been looking at yourself all day. And then you come up and say, baby, how do I look? And, and, and you saying, bro, you just looked in the mirror. You know you look good. Okay, but she needs you to tell her. She needs to be reassured from you that, that she looks good. She needs to hear it from you. No matter how successful she is, how self-assured and mature she is, she needs to hear it from you. No matter how long you've been together, she needs to hear that from you. No matter how gorgeous other people may tell her she is, she needs to hear it from you. No matter how moved to tears of gratitude you were the last time you said it, she still needs to hear it. And then no matter how old or how young she is, she still needs to hear it. Now, some facts you need to know. Last thing. Number one, inside your dear wife, that little girl is still very much alive, that little girl that wants to twirl just for you. She's still there. She just want to twirl for you. In your marriage, whether you find her beautiful may or may not be foremost on your mind, but it is an everyday, even if it's subconscious, issue for her. Even if, even if it's self-conscious, she wants to know you know, notice her. In your house, there's really only one mirror. And that mirror is you. You're the mirror. You tell her that she looks good. Then, every day, watch this, you can reflect back to her the words that she needs to hear the most. But if you don't, you leave her vulnerable to both all the inner questions and the external questions. You need to know that she needs to hear it from you. In your hand, you hold the hammer, guys. You hold the hammer with your words for her. Watch this. She needs emotional responsiveness from you, all right? Last things. How do you support her emotionally? Ask her directly how you can support her. If you're not sure what to do for your wife, ask her. Baby, how can I help you? Baby, how, how can I help you? Baby, how can I support you? Ask her. Listen intently when she talks to you. Listen. Number three, validate her feelings. I understand you to say you need this for me, baby. Offer advice if she asks you for it. Don't just try to fix it unless she asks. Sometimes women just need to tell you stuff. She don't need no help. She just need to tell you. Compliment her strengths and say I love you often to her. Baby, you know I love you. Baby, you know I love you. Ephesians 5, 32. Watch this. This is a great mystery, Paul writes. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Marriage is a microcosm of the church. Marriage. Christ and the church. Marriage. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as he loves himself. So the wife see that she reverence her husband. God's design for marriage. I pray that I've shared something with you to make you think about how you interact with your significant other, how you talk, how you think, how you live, how you improve your relationship. It's all based on God's word. Listen, if you're here, you're not a member of the body of Christ. We want you to know that you function better together in the Lord. If both of you are answering to God, you'll treat each other right. If you're both answering to God, 
And if you're not a member of the body of Christ, we invite you to become part of God's spiritual family. You come by hearing the good news that he died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. If you're willing to repent of your sin, confess him as Lord, and surrender to baptism for the remission of your sins, you can be added to the body called the church. If you are a member, you have not lived faithful. And the spirit of God has convicted you in the area of your life that you need convicting in. I pray you have the courage to respond to the conviction of the word of God and do so right now while we together stand and sing.